Welcome back. Uh, today, we are going to move into lecture 24, and we will be talking about phonons. Last time, we spoke about photons, which were uh, fundamental excitations of the electromagnetic field. And here, we are going to talk about phonons, which, as we will discuss, are fundamental excitations of the lattice vibrations. So uh, I'm, I have to warn you at the outset of this uh, lecture that this is not a solid state physics lecture. So uh, I'm going to do my best to introduce you to the notion of phonons, but a full treatment should probably be delayed until you take a solid state physics course. So I'm going to try to explain to you the basic uh, and fundamental principles that you need to get in order to, to understand the temperature effect of phonons. So in this uh, lecture, we'll talk about the Einstein model, the Debye model, and we will discuss quite a bit about dispersion relations. So I will remind you what uh, the notion about the notion of uh, dispersion relation. And uh, you, the, the kind of system that we are going to consider is a system like this, where we have a solid, and we will consider that each atom in that solid, uh, they are all they are connected by by springs. That is, the closest atoms are, are connected by springs. Uh, if they are all the same atoms, the springs are all the same. And the question is, knowing that each spring can can vibrate, what are the possible vibrations of this system? So this is basically what a phonon is. A phonon is is a, is one of those vibrations of the crystal, and there are more than one phonon. I'd like to tell you also that we already discussed this a little bit. We look at the when we did the, the lecture lecture 19 on the equipartition theorem, we already calculated the heat capacity of the system. And we found that uh, uh, so long as the equipartition uh, result is correct, so as you know, at high enough temperature, and so long as we see in the harmonic approximation, uh, we found that the, the heat capacity per mole was 3R or 3 kB per Per, uh, per atom. So we'll see if we can, uh, the result that we are going to discuss today are going to be compatible with this. So phonons, let's say a little bit about phonons. Uh, so first of all, the phonons uh, are considered as excitations of the, of the lattice, of an of a atomic lattice, a crystal lattice. And the, the energy of those, ex, uh, those excitations are h bar omega, where omega is the angular frequency of those vibrations. So of course they are like waves, so they, they, they do vibrate. Um, so as I mentioned a minute ago, the phonons are the quantized elementary lattice waves. So when we look at the, at the simple harmonic oscillator, this is kind of a phonon if you want, but there's only one, one vibration for, the, for that system. Here, we are going to have a collection of them because we have multiple atoms. And as you know, if you have multiple atoms, that means that you have three and degrees of freedom. So those vibrations uh, are going to be called uh, normal mode. And the normal mode um, is basically the, the, all those modes, the list of, of possible vibrations that are independent from one another. So I like here, this is where the math is actually useful. Uh, the normal modes are actually obtained from diagonizing a symmetric matrix. Therefore, those modes are uh, orthogonal to each other. And they correspond to a, to a fundamental vibration. So I'm giving you all this without proof, but the, the, the points remain because they are orthogonal to each other. They are also independent. And so long as we stay in the harmonic approximation, there is no crosstalk between the normal mode. As you know, that's going to be very important when we calculate the partition function. Since the partition function is different if we have independent system versus interacting system, as we have discussed. But I will review that again. Uh, we are going to consider each of those modes as simple harmonic oscillators. So with everything that we've learned about partition function of a single harmonic oscillator. And um, one thing that's very important, and in fact, this is going to be the, 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 the thing that we tune throughout this lecture, is how to understand the angular frequency versus the wave vector k. So this is a notion that uh, students uh, sometimes have trouble with. I'm going to try to explain that to you. A dispersion relation is really what's telling you how fast a wave oscillates as a function of its wavelength. As you know, the wave vector k is 2 pi over lambda, lambda being the wavelength. And uh, so, so basically what when we say 
uh, omega versus k, we are really talking about how what is the vibrational frequency of a wave propagating in a crystal as a function of its wavelength. So this is what we call a dispersion relation. And we know, for example, the dispersion relation we've noted we've we've seen one. So we know the one for photons, right? We just had uh, we just had omega is equal to uh, ck if I for if I remember well. So this is just a straight line, right? This is this is what we've seen in the previous lecture. So we'll see that it's a little bit different here, and I'm I'm going to show you two very simple examples where we we will calculate those dispersion relations. So basically finding the the frequency as a function of wavelength, um, and I also show you real examples uh, in this lecture. So actually, I'm going to start right there. So these are these on the left hand side. As, don't worry too much about the right hand side for now. Just focus on this. And these are um, these are the relationships. So these are the, the dispersion curve. So frequencies as the function of the wave vector. By the way, we usually call it Q. Uh, when it comes to phonons, instead of k, when it comes to photons, it's just an, uh, just a, a convention. Uh, but you could, in principle, use k here if you wanted to. But we typically use q for for uh, for phonon. Uh, the point is, we have those curves that correspond to the frequency as a function of wavelength. I'm not going to go in detail about this notation here. Uh, suffice to say uh, that these correspond to different direction in the for the crystal lattice. Okay. So this is what this is what we have. Let's not worry about how we get it, and I'm going to explain some features. The point remains because we 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 can consider the wavelength as a label. So the the, the wave vector q, which is the inverse of the wavelength, as a label. Uh, we see from this that um, we have a certain number of states depending on the frequency omega. Okay, so we go back to what we call the density of state, and I will discuss that in a bit more detail in a second. And if you look at the density of state of copper, for instance, you will see that as a function of frequency, you have an increased number of states and, and sometimes a dip. And you're going to have a dip, for example, when you have uh, in, this, in this area, for example, here. And then you're going to have maxima. And the maxima is when we have flat band, because flat band means that for a very tiny interval of frequency, you have lots of state. And this is what the density of state, of, of course, means. If it is not clear to you at this point, um, do not worry and do not uh, do not tune out just yet. We are going to to describe that in a, in, in, a, in a moment. For now, what you need to understand is that this density of state here uh, provides us the priority distribution, as we discussed before, that we need to calculate um, for the distribution of state that we need to calculate the partition function, okay? Now, the problem is how do we model this? And we will introduce two methods, two historical methods to, to uh, model this complicated uh, curve right here. So, so that's what we are going to do now. So I, that's the reason why I'm showing you this at the beginning of this lecture. Okay, so let's start with Einstein model. Uh, so the, remember that the model we are looking for is that how do we describe the number of vibrational states as a function of frequency, okay? So the Einstein model is actually pretty, as simple as it gets, if you want, even though it's very successful. It's just to say that the density of state, so the number of state between omega and omega plus g omega, right? The definition of g of, the, of omega, that density of state is actually a, the, the Dirac delta, okay? Uh, it's a Dirac delta that simply is there to say all the, the modes that have the same frequency. That's, what it, that's how you translate this uh, mathematically. So all the modes that have a single frequency, of course, you can argue that it's a pretty, uh, pretty mediocre uh, approximation, but you will see that it works pretty well. And that frequency, we, we, for now, we are going to call it the Einstein omega. Okay, we'll see. We come to we we'll come in a second to explain what that omega should be, that omega e should be. But we are going to call it Einstein omega. Okay, so that's all nice. Now we know that if we have a solid with n modes, with n atoms, sorry, there are three n modes, right? There are three. We discussed this already when we looked with when we were in the lecture on equipartition theorem. 
And so that means that we have three N mode simply because, uh, remember, each atom has, it's connected to, um, it's connected to, 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 uh, to the number, to, how can I say, uh, they are connected to other atoms through the springs as we discussed that. And there are three of them, uh, unique spring per, per atom. I know it's six, but because they share the spring, it's on average is three per atom. Um, so one thing just to make sure that you, you guys are not too confused that actually in, in a, in a, in, in a finite solid like this, we have three and minus six mode. Why? Because among all the modes, there are some that are just translation of the entire system in either X, Y, and Z, and three rotations along, around the X, Y, or Z axis. These do not correspond to vibrations. So usually we have three and minus six. However, we don't worry too much about the six because we are talking about macroscopic solid. So N is extremely large. Even if you have one mole of copper, let's say, that's 10 to the power 23, um, uh, N equal, N, N equal uh, 6, 10 to the power 23, the Avogadro number. So adding 6 or subtracting 6 make, makes essentially no, no difference whatsoever. But to be correct, the number of modes is really 3 and minus 6. We will suppose that those modes do, uh, do not interact and are independent. So this is actually the, uh, an assumption that we will keep using uh, for the other model that we will look at. And that allows us to calculate the partition function. So the partition function of a collection of three n mode that do not interact is simply the product of all the partition function. Well, we've discussed this at deta in details in the past few lectures. Of course, that means that the, the logarithm of that partition function is just the sum of the logarithm, as we have seen a number of times. And zk, as we calculate, as we noted here is the partition function of a single mode. And remember, what we decided to do is that each single mode is a harmonic oscillator. It's just, a, it's just a vibe, a, 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 an oscillation. And this is nice because we calculated this. We already know the partition function of a single simple harmonic oscillator is just the sum of all the Boltzmann factor. And we know the energy of a quantum oscillator. This is n plus 1 half h bar omega beta and go from zero to infinity. So a few comments, uh, just to make sure that, uh, that, just to make sure that you remember this. Uh, here, all the frequencies we said are all the same. It's, it's the Einstein frequency. That's what we decided to do. And uh, the one half here is actually the zero point energy. Okay, that means that the energy of the oscillator is never zero. So this is a very simple uh, sum to calculate, and we obtain this result that we have seen a number of times already in this in this course. One thing that we will need, as you know, is the logarithm of z, uh, and then we know that the logarithm of z is just a sum of the logarithm of zk, and this is very straightforward to calculate the logarithm of this, so simply the logarithm of the numerator minus the logarithm of the denominator, and we can obtain this directly. As you know, the partition function is very important because we can get all the other properties of the material, of the, of the, thermodynamics, uh, the thermodynamic properties, and the logarithm is usually comes into the game. So we probably have everything we need to understand Einstein model at this point. So just to, re to repeat so it's clear, the Einstein model uses as this, the main assumption that all the frequencies, all the density of state, uh, is actually a Dirac, a Dirac delta. In other words, all the oscillatory frequencies are one single frequency. So all the, the uh, oscillators uh, vibrate at the same frequency. This is actually a very rough um, approximation. Okay. However, however, uh, because we have the right number of modes, this model keeps the number of modes to three n. Okay. Um, it turns out that it's it, because of this, the normalization is right. A lot of results that you obtain from this simple model are actually very close to experiment. We are going to, let's not jump the guns and, and we, we are going to, to get there. So just to, just to remind you, this is the, 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 this plot here, the density of state is the one that's actually the experimental one. So the, the full curves and the Einstein model simply using a single approximate all these features by a single peak. Okay. So 
yeah, it looks like pretty rough, but this is this is the idea. And by the way, maybe it's not that bad if we were to try to represent this peak here. Well, we'll discuss that in a few minutes. Okay, so let's go back to this. We calculated the logarithm of the partition function, and now, of course, we can get the internal energy. Internal energy is something we've seen before, is minus the derivative with respect to k, 1 over kdt. Uh, this is a straightforward in, uh, derivation, and we obtain this energy here, and which can we can uh, rearrange a little bit the, the, the different terms. It's not that's not very complicated again, uh, and then we obtain that the um, the internal energy is going to be equal to this equation here, which I'm not spelling out because it's just written written right there. Now, one thing that people like to do is to, instead of using the Einstein frequency, we, uh, the Einstein angular frequency here, we actually use the Einstein temperature, okay? Uh, it's capital theta E. And the reason why we can do this is, of course, h bar omega is the energy of, a, of a elementary excitation, and kBT is also an energy. So basically, here we are essentially changing the units between the frequency, the Einstein frequency, and the Einstein, and the Einstein temperature. It's just that it's it's you typically use the Einstein temperature, as you know, to move from one to the other. You have h bar, the Planck constant, the reduced Planck constant, and kb, the Boltzmann constant. Nothing really difficult. One thing that I should also mention from going to this from this equation to this one, we move from the number of particle n to r. Uh, I mean, actually, we move from kb to r, but because we di we divided this equation by the Avogadro number, so that this equation is really a per mole equation, while this equation was for n particle. This is something we've seen before. This is how kb becomes r. We've discussed this at deta in detail, and uh, I invite you to review this if if it's uh, if it's a bit blurry uh, in your memory. Very nice, we have the internal energy. Now we can uh, look at what happens at very high temperature. So this is what we had in the previous slide. And if we have a very large temperature, we can actually look at what happens to the exponential. As you know, very large temperature means that the argument here is very small. And if it's very small, if you use Taylor, uh, Taylor series, Taylor expansion uh, close to zero, and of course the exponential close to zero is simply the argument plus one, right? This is the idea. This is the argument plus one. If, if x equal to zero, it's of course one, and this is the first linear term. So basically, this term here is simply one plus um, theta e over t, and of course, it gets rid of one here, so we obtain, obtain directly here. But it's nice, because this is very easy to simplify, and we see that when the temperature gets really large, this term, of course, is much smaller than this term when temperature is very large. And we find that the internal energy is 3RT, which is something that we've seen, of course, for the equipartition result. So that's nice. We have the equipartition result. That's not a big surprise, of course, because we are using uh, essentially the same, uh, the same framework. The only difference is that now we include the density of state. But since we are looking at a large temperature, uh, the distance between the level does not matter anymore. So, that makes sense that we have the same result, but it's always good to check. Um, we can also look at the molar heat capacity. So molar heat capacity, remember, it's the heat capacity per mole right, of the Einstein solid. So we can calculate the capacity as a derivative of the internal energy with respect to temperature. One thing that's important here, and it's a question that's being usually asked in either test to make sure that students follow, why don't we use a a V or a P, because remember, we, we define the heat capacity at constant pressure or constant volume. Uh, the reason why uh, the reason why we, we do not worry too much about that is because for solid, CP and CV are, are pretty much the same, because there is no, there's no much of the energy that goes into uh, compressing the material as opposed to a gas, for example, okay? So that's the reason why we usually drop the V or P, because these are essentially the same. So we can calculate the derivative from the equation I had before, and the derivative is elementary. We obtain this, this equation right there, and we can rewrite it in a slightly uh, nicer way by, by writing that x is equal to theta e over t. Nothing really complicated. Again, remember that this is true for every temperature, 
Uh, we don't have, we did not take the limit of high temperature yet or small temperature. Well, we, we are going to do that just now. So when the temperature goes to zero, uh, that means that X goes to infinity. And when X goes to infinity, uh, this term uh, is the largest term, so, but it's square. So, but it, so it simplifies with this, so we get N minus X and X square. So this falls very fast. This is an exponential. Uh, as you know, all the exponential, the decay exponential always decay faster than uh, that any polynomial grows. So that's going to be, that's going to be uh, clear that the heat capacity will fall very fast. In fact, it falls a bit too fast compared to experiments. And um, we, we, we will get a better, a better description in a minute. And the reason why it falls very fast compared to experiment is because the low temperature, at low temperature, we start to uh, to explore or if you to visit the low frequency mode in the density of state. But those low frequency mode in the Einstein model are not very well described because we describe the entire mo model as a single delta peak. So of course, when at low temperature, we do not expect this to be good. On the other hand, at high temperature, all the mode are basically um, ever actually been uh, visited and including so this is really an average effect so if the peak should actually be pretty good to describe the the average of the entire system the peak that we have in the Einstein distribution and in fact at very large temperature so when x equals zero we find that the heat capacity is 3r and the heat capacity 3r is the Dulong petit that we've already seen uh, in a, a lecture 19 so this is actually the right the, the right uh, the right limiting case. As, as I said, that makes sense because at high temperature, the details of the density of state does not matter as much as the fact that it's normalized correctly, which it is for the Einstein model, this is the, the right delta. That's very good. Uh, now it's time to move to, a, to, another, to another model, which is a Debye model. So the Debye model is a little bit uh, more advanced, I would say, but we will see the difference uh, in a minute. So just to remind you, what we did for the Einstein model, if we, we never actually had to introduce the, 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 um, the delta because the delta came into the sum to the partition function, but this is really what we did uh, is the fact that the density of states, so the number of states between omega and omega plus b omega is just represented by this Dirac delta. And the three hand here, make sure that the system is, is the, the, the integral is properly normalized. In other words, we know we have three n state. You can argue it should be three n minus six, but n is so large, it doesn't matter. Okay, so very nice. So what does the Debye model do? Well, the Debye model basically says, well, a single peak is as, uh, as crude as it gets. Let's try to do a little bit better. Let's suppose that for the number of state between omega and d, d plus omega, we are going to suppose that all the waves travel at the same speed Vs, okay, which is the speed of sound. Okay, remember Q is 2 pi over lambda, as we discussed before. So basically what we are saying now is that all the all the mode, all the, all the phonons go uh, uh, travel at the same at the same uh, speed. Okay? And that means that if you write that in, in math, that means that the frequency, the angular frequency is Vs speed of, of sound times Q. So let's try to take a moment here. First of all, the units are right. This is, this is frequency, so it's a per second. It's Q, it's two pi over lambda, so it's a per meter, if you will. So this uh, velocity is meter per second, so meter per second times uh, meter minus one gets get a frequency, so that's good. So basically saying that all the waves travel at the same speed Vs, simply means that the dispersion relation is omega is equal to Vsq. So basically, it looks very much like what we used for, for, phonons, uh, for photons, but in that case, we had the speed of light. So it's just gonna be a straight line in the omega versus Q plot, okay? Uh, so is that better? Well, we are going to see that in a second. So first of all, we, the advantage of this is that we can now calculate the density of state as a function of q. And in fact, we've done it already a number of times. Uh, this is exactly the same as we did in the previous lecture for phonons, but let me try to re-explain to you a little bit here. 
Uh, the, the number of state between Q and Q plus DQ, so again, Q is the wave vector, is going to be the volume of the shell, the spherical shell. So again, the volume of the spherical shell is the surface of the spherical shell, 4 pi Q squared, times the thickness. Okay? And we divide that by, this, by the volume of, that each individual state takes, which is 2 pi over L cubed in three dimension. And why, where, where, did, where does that come from? Well, it comes from the fact that the waves are confined in a volume of length, uh, of, of, of a cubic volume of length uh, of side uh, L. Okay? So this is something we've seen a number of times. It's very important to, uh, to realize this. Here, uh, uh, when we did photons, we had a factor of two because you have two polarization. Here we have three, a factor of three because we have three possible uh, uh, possibilities for the waves, which is one longitudinal, so along the, the direction, and two transverse, so perpendicular the direction. So it's a factor of three here. Very good. So basically, this equation, if we say that L cube is equal to V, as, as always, we find the density of state, so the number of state between Q and Q plus V cube given by this formula. Now, we know in the partition function, we usually sum over energies. And what we know is uh, usually the energy is h bar omega for this for these uh, elementary excitations, so that's what we are we are going to look into. So if we consider that the frequency is v s q, okay, so it's nice because it's linear. We can transform this uh, density of state per per q, if you will, per per uh, wave vector into a density of state per frequency, and this is what we obtain. Uh, this is really fairly straightforward. Uh, you have a, a cubic term in Q, Q square. You have a VS, VS square coming from here, VS coming from here. So that's, uh, that's VS cubed, okay? The, that, that allows me to, to make the replacement. That's, that's actually pretty straightforward because uh, you can see from here to here. That's nice because that gives me the density of state. This is what I need to calculate the partition function. Remember, partition function is going to be obtained from, from an integral over all the Boltzmann factor for which we have to include the density of state or basically the degeneracy, that's what it does. So just to be clear, this density of state now, GW, is a, a quadratic term in omega. So basically it's a parabola, okay? It's a parabola right here, okay? Um, it's a parabola, but we have to make sure that that parabola is normalized properly. Remember, we need to make sure that we have three n states in that density. So we don't want to create states that don't exist. And uh, I'm, maybe I'm jumping a little bit ahead of, of, of the next slide, but the point is that that means that when I integrate this, I need to obtain three n. And that will force me to stop at some point where I obtain three n. And the point where I have to stop is called the Debye frequency. So the, the capital D here means the Debye frequency. So this is basically all the way when I stop uh, integrating. So this is what we obtain. And this Debye frequency is obtained. So mathematically, what I just said, you integrate this function until you find that you have 3n. Remember, it's a density of state. So the number of state between 0 and the Debye frequency has to be 3n for proper, proper normalization, since I know I have 3n state. Very nice. So now the red curve here. So remember, uh, the red curve represented the Bay model. Okay. So what's interesting here, of course, is the fact that uh, this is the, the experimental result for the density of state for copper. And now instead of representing this by a Dirac delta as we did for with the Einstein model, we are representing this with a parabola. It is still pretty crude. You see, you do not represent those features or this dip. But I would say that in general, especially at low frequency, we are doing a pretty good job, okay? Doing a pretty good job. So you expect the Dubai, the Dubai uh, model to work well, especially for those low energy excitation, which would occur at low temperature. So hopefully at low temperature, we have a better description. And, and we actually do, so we are going to see that. So now we have everything we need to calculate the partition function. And from there, we can calculate the energy and the heat capacity. Let's do it. So we have this density that I explained in a minute, and we have to go to the, the by frequency. So we can calculate this is very straightforward calculation. This is basically telling you 
until which frequency you have to integrate. Same thing as we did before for the Einstein, for the Einstein uh, temperature, we can also introduce the Debye temperature, which is simply a, a, a change of units, if you will, from the uh, Debye frequency. And again, you can change the units by h bar, omega, and kBT, and so you obtain a temperature, thereby temperature. So in fact, it's very important. The Debye temperature is basically close to what we say the maximum frequency that we have to take into account, right? It's, it's until when we have to stop to get 3N. So this is a good property of material. Uh, so uh, there are examples, and it's taken from the, from the textbook, so from the Blundell and Blundell textbook. And we see that different materials will have different uh, Debye frequency. And this is actually quite interesting here because uh, even though this is not a temperature you measure, you know, you do not measure this temperature with a thermometer, uh, it represents the highest frequency that you can have in your system. And of course, the highest frequency uh, means that you, if you have a, a stiffer system, like, a, like a, for example, uh, diamond is, is, a, is a very uh, stiff material, and uh, com as compared to neon, for example, which is, which, is a, uh, uh, which is definitely not a stiff material because it's essentially very little interaction between the particles. So you see that uh, these properties provide, th th this Dubai uh, temperature provides uh, a very interesting uh, way to see uh, what kind of chemistry happens in the, solid, in the, in the system, uh, going from a gas to, to, to a solid, basically. Again, I'd like to insist that this temperature has nothing to do with uh, a temperature you measure. It's really this temperature from the model of the Dubai model, but it's, it's very close to the maximum uh, frequency of the phonons that we have in the system. Okay, good. Now, as, as I said a couple of minutes ago, we are going to calculate the internal energy and we are going to calculate uh, the heat capacity. So the internal energy, uh, Again, same as always, exact same equation as we use for, um, for, the, for the Einstein model is just that the density of state now is not a simple direct function, uh, direct distribution, but instead is, this, is the one we just calculated. Uh, and uh, uh, we have not yet introduced it here. We're just playing a little bit with, with these, these equations. And if you remember what the, the density of state is and the Debye, uh, frequency uh, uh, is, you can reintroduce those properties in here and obtain, finally, uh, the logarithm of z. Okay, so this is a little bit cumbersome. It's, it's the math here looks a little bit uh, not as clean as we would like it to be, but uh, we are going to make it. And so we can certainly calculate the derivative of this, the minus the derivative of this to get the internal energy, and we obtain that the internal energy is obtained by this equation here, where we have not performed the integral yet. We are going to do it when we calculate the heat capacity. This is the internal energy. This is how we get get it. Um, the only complication is is that is the bookkeeping to make sure you don't lose anything when you do the math. But in terms of the approach to start from the partition function all the way to the internal energy is the same as what we've done a number of times in this in this course. So the heat capacity is something that we can measure directly, right? So it can, can be calculated from the derivative. Again, no P and V uh, subscript is necessary for a solid. And we obtain, uh, using the internal energy that I had from the previous slide, so I will produce it here, can calculate the, capacity, the heat capacity as the derivative with respect to temperature. And we obtain, we obtain this, this equation that's not necessarily good looking. It doesn't really matter what is a good looking equation anyway. But the point is we can analyze this and we can analyze it by uh, simplifying a little bit the notation by, by writing x equal h bar beta omega. Uh, beta again is one over kbt. Nice. Now, here's the result that we obtain when we, when we plot c over three r. We already know that the Einstein model does indeed uh, converge to three r at, at very high temperature. And we also know that it decays, as I mentioned to you, well, I just said that to you, uh, that it decays a bit too fast. Okay, it decays a bit too fast because we do not represent the low frequency very well. Now, the Debye model seems to, to not decay as fast as the Einstein model, and we will see that this behavior is actually the appropriate behavior. Uh, we can actually zoom here and do the uh, calculate, uh, actually represent the logarithm of this. 
the the log scale of this, and then we see that indeed at very low temperature, uh, we find that uh, and here the 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 Dubai uh, temperature and the the Einstein temperature are chosen to be the same. You see that the Dubai temperature uh, behaves like uh, like a power of t, right? It's it's a log it's a log log scale, so a power is going to be represented by a straight a straight line. While the the Einstein model decays exponentially, as we have seen, uh, and therefore it is represented by by this kind of curve. So Einstein the Einstein model decays actually too fast compared to experiment, which is very close to the Dubai model. So let's try to see this analytically a little bit. Uh, so this is the formula I already showed you uh, five minutes ago. Uh, let's let's look at the the two limiting cases uh, of uh, high temperature and then high, and then low temperature. At a, at high temperature, um, this the, the beta gets gets to zero, right? It's it's uh, one one over kBT. Uh, so we get x equal to zero. So we know that this is very close to uh, this is very close to x, right? Because e to the power x is one plus x. Uh, so that means I have x left, x square, x x four divided by x square. And of course, e of x close to x equal to zero is uh, is indeed uh, one. So I obtain this this formula here that we can easily integrate, right? We have x square, so that's x cubed over three, uh, calculated at the 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 by the the by uh, uh, x, if you will, and we obtain three r, which again is the same result that we found for Einstein and the Dulong petit. And again, that's not really surprising because all those models were using the right uh, description. With the right number of modes. Remember that the Dulong Petit and the equipartition theorem were based solely on the fact that we were taking into account the right number of modes that come from the equipartition. So we did this with both Einstein and Dubai, and the details of the density of state does not do not matter anymore when we have we are at very high temperature. Okay, this is a reminder. Now low temperature is a little bit more interesting. At low temperature. We can we can calculate the the how this this is going, and we can actually use that use a use a formula. Uh, why why can we use a, a formula from a table? Because now the integral is actually a, a, an integral from zero to infinity. Because at very low temperature, x uh, goes to infinity, right? Because beta is one over kBT. So at very low temperature, one over kBT goes to infinity. So x goes to infinity. And this integral can be found in, in a table of integral. Uh, and we obtain that your, the result you obtain is the, the heat capacity uh, behaves like 1 over uh, x to the power 3d, which is, of course, means that it's the temperature cube, which is exactly what we found on the previous slide. And this result is actually pretty close to, to what you expect to have experimentally, uh, much better than the Einstein model. OK. now. Let's try to let's try to do even better. Uh, I like to spend the the last few minutes uh, here to try to explain to you where we can ex understand those dispers this, this dispersion relation. So again, just to remind you, the dispersion relation are going to give you the frequency as a function of wave vector. So how fast is a, a wave oscillates as a function of its wavelength. That's basically what it does. Now we are going to use we always with the simplest model, which is a one single atomic chain of atoms that are all the same, all the same mass, all the same spring constant. And so the most important thing to understand for the entire uh, for the entire discussion is this: this entire discussion is based on Newton's law, the second law. And we are going to write u of n as being the displacement so along x, okay, the displacement of an atom of atom number n. Um, from its um, uh, from its equilibrium position, okay. So so dot dot means the acceleration. So so mass times the acceleration, let's say of this atom, is going to be equal to the force on that atom, right? This is the second. This is the Newton's second law. Well, the force on that atom is related to the Hooke's law from the spring here and from the spring here. So the spring, the force is of course, as you know. Minus kx, okay, depending on how you, you look at your, you put your axis, you place your axis. The point remains is that if what matters is the difference between those two displacements. Indeed, 
If the two displacements were the same, the spring will not be compressed or elongated, so there will be no force. So what really matters is the difference between these two. So there will be an interaction, in fact, this is this one, Inter this will be an interaction from the spring between n and, and n minus 1. This is this one. So the difference, how, how much the, the spring is compressed or elongated. And of course, a force coming from the next one, because this is the only the way we do it. So if you understand this, you basically have understood the whole thing, because what it means, it, it really means um, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's the Newton's law, okay? With the Hooke's law for the, for the spring. And of course, we can rearrange the term and we obtain this. K is the uh, force constant for a single spring. Yeah. Very good. So we obtain this. And what we'd say is that we would like to try a wave-like solution for this. So we just say, OK, the displacement <coughs> along this chain is going to look like a wave. OK, this is what I'm looking at. And now the advantage, of course, of a wave equation, as you've seen in your introductory physics course, is that there is an an oscillation, uh, oscillatory behavior, because it's uh, 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 which is related to the separation a between between the, the, the atoms, and also an oscillatory behavior in time, uh, which is related to the angular angular uh, frequency here. So this is the typical thing that we look at. We look at the propagating wave. So we we can just um, substitute this solution in here and see and see if we can do it. If we can if we can can solve it in fact if you do this the the advantage is that things get pretty simple because the second derivative here is going to respect to time right is what the dot dot does we obtain uh, i omega times uh, i omega okay so that's minus omega square times m it's what obtained here and on the right hand side times the exponential of course which is going to 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 uh, simplify and then we have to calculate these things here. And these things here just depend on n, which means that we are moving away from one lattice constant a and one, one, one away to the right and one away to the left here. And so we obtain this equation. And basically, believe it or not, but it's done because now you know the uh, Euler relationship for the complex exponential. And you see probably a sign QA uh, here, actually the two sine QA, and you or a, a cosine QA because it's a plus. Yes, uh, uh, yes, indeed. Uh, so, so two cosine QA. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so we obtain that, and and we we see of course that we rearrange and we obtain an equation like this, which is a relationship, and it's what's important. It's a relationship between the frequency omega, and the wavelength Q. Indeed. K, M, and A are constant, the parameters for the problem. It tells you the mass of the atoms, the strength of the of the spring, so the strength of the bond, if you will, and A, which is just a lattice constant. So basically, what you have here is exactly what I advertised at the beginning of this lecture as being a dispersion relation, which provides you a relation between the frequency and the wave vector. So this is very nice because it simply imposes that condition that if you have a given wave vector, you must have a certain frequency. So it tells you, this problem tells you, if I have a wave of a certain wavelength, it has to oscillate at a, at a specific frequency. Okay? So this is what a, a, a phonon dispersion relation is. Uh, and you can plot this. You can plot this. Uh, you can plot omega as for omega versus Q, right? Sometimes omega versus k, but as I told you, we use q for phonons typically. And what we what we found what we find is that of course here we, we recognize the the square of half of the of the angle of the uh, uh, the square of half of the of the angle. Uh, I'm not going to go there. It's it's very basic trigonometry. But the point remains that you obtain this very nice curve that looks like sine. Okay. Um, this this term here, is this this zone where Q exists, is called the Brillouin zone. But we are not going to worry about that uh, in this course because it's not necessary for what we want to do. The point remains, though, when Q is very small, and this is called the very long wavelength limit. Remember, Q is two pi over lambda in one dimension, right? So that means that a long wavelength, very long wavelength limit, means a very small value of Q. And in that case, cos QA is almost equal to 
to uh, yeah it's almost equal to one my one uh, minus QA okay so that means that when we get here we obtain that the frequency is actually going as a straight line if I'm not mistaken actually I'm sorry this is the 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 Taylor series is of course not one minus QA it's one plus QA square over two right uh, sorry about that so. So we obtain this result, and we find that at, at very uh, long wavelength, 1 minus QA, by defining the Taylor series of cos QA as an ter uh, 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 independent term in the quadratic term, means that omega square is proportional to QA square. In other words, this is a straight line. So very close for the very long wavelength, we have a straight line. But remember, the straight line the frequency as a function of, of the wave vector straight line is the Debye approximation. Okay, so the Debye approximation is actually this term here, which is nothing else than the straight line. So we have something that looks very much like the long wavelength limit looks, looks actually, uh, it's actually exactly correct. We are missing this, of course, but all the low energy excitations are very well described. And this is the reason why the Debye model is so good at uh, predicting the right heat capacity at low temperature. Uh, and of course, this is not the case for the Einstein model. Uh, I just like to show you here a little plot uh, for those who to understand a bit better. So the largest wavelengths you can have in a solid of length L is actually like this. Longer wavelengths means a fewer oscillation. Then as you increase the wavelength, you decrease the wavelength, uh, and you get to a larger and larger wave vector. You obtain something that's more and more and more oscillatory in space. So this is basically the long wavelength limit. And as you move forward, you have a larger, uh, you have a smaller and smaller wavelength. So a larger and larger wave vector. So this is this is how you do. Okay. So just to go back, uh, this is this is these are the the type of, uh, of uh, experimental data and actually empirical data that you could obtain to get the phonon, uh, the, the relation, the, the, the dispersion relation uh, for copper, for example. And as I said before, we, I already showed you this picture before, uh, this is a bit more complicated than a simple chain of atom, but you can represent very well those straight line close to zero, okay, the straight line. And we actually call them the acoustic, uh, Acoustic branches because uh, they correspond the the the, the, the velocity that so the, the the dispersion relation corresponds to the velocity of sound in that material. So this is this is what we do. These are the the actual uh, band structure we call them. So the dispersion relation for an actual system uh, as measured by uh, uh, inelastic neutron scattering. Uh, and so this is the density of state that we were working with. And you can see that the Bi model is pretty good too. Uh, this is this is what we've done. Now it turns out that in 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 reality, and this is something I'd like to mention here so that you understand that the Einstein model is actually useful in some instances as well. It's not it's not just that the Debye model is, is systematically better than Einstein. The point is, in in uh, very often we have more than one atomic type. So uh, the next exercise to to do as I just you can write. Uh, Newton's second law uh, for these problems, where now you have two types of, of masses. You can even use the same same spring if you want. Actually, they're all the same, obviously, because they always join the, the two. I mean, a big M and a small M. And you can you can actually solve this uh, the same way as I solved five minutes ago. And when we do that, you actually start to find modes that are in addition to these modes that we've seen before. Right, signs that behaves like signs and, and almost a straight line at close to the long wavelength. You also have another mode here, which is called an optical mode. And an optical mode is, is actually correspond to this branch that does not go to zero uh, at Q equals zero. And they actually the reason why they are, calculated, they are called optical mode as opposed to acoustic mode is because they correspond to the oscillation of a dipole moment. And the oscillation of a dipole moment, as you know, can um, 
interact, can couple with an external uh, uh, electromagnetic field, and therefore they can be optically excited. Okay, so this is the reason why they are here. And just as a reminder, the acoustic mode corresponds to this propagation of sound in this system. So it corresponds to a, to a finite ve uh, sound velocity, even for, uh, at, at the long wavelength limit. So I'm not going to describe this in detail. Again, this is more for a solicited physics course. Uh, I would be happy to provide more information. Uh, I'd like to show you an animation of this so that it's a little bit clear what we have. Uh, this is something I obtained from physicsanimation.com on YouTube. Uh, and I'd like to show that to you. So this is basically, we have a chain. You have to consider that it's a chain. We just show three of the atoms in the chain. They have two different masses. So you see what happens is that um, you can see that this is the, these are here, the acoustic mode. These are just moving. Or this is also an acoustic mode where the two big masses move in uh, out of phase uh, compared to the small mass that doesn't move. And here we have, uh, a change in phase between the different the different modes, and this change in phase can actually induce uh, it correspond to the existence of a of a dipole moment, uh, and uh, that's why they're called the uh, uh, optical mode, and they can be excited that way. So this is this is something that you can you can easily obtain from the analysis of the band. So now we may wonder about the the, the Bay versus Einstein model. Uh, and uh, in fact, we are not surprised that the Bay model is so, is so good at the low temperature uh, because it represents the, 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 low, the, the, the low temperature behavior. In other words, the, the, the low excitation behavior, the small frequencies, which correspond to the, uh, to the acoustic mode. And uh, we, we have, we've seen for the simple model of the atomic chain that actually the, the Bay model is, is essentially exact at very low frequencies, at very large uh, wavelengths. Now, you, you may say that the Einstein model is not, so, is not so good, but in fact, the Einstein model represents very well those kind of peaks that we have. And these peaks correspond to the flat band uh, in the band structure of the, the dispersion of omega versus, uh, versus Q. Uh, how do I know it's a peak? Well, because if it's a flat band, that means that even a small change in the frequency corresponds to um, uh, the derivative, if you will, of the of the band, uh, which is corresponds to the number of states, is, is very large. It's it's essentially infinite, infinite. So that's very well represented by those uh, sharp peak which we have in the Einstein model. So the Einstein model will be will be pretty good for the for the optical mode. So this this concludes this uh, this screencast on on uh, phonons, uh, the vibration of uh, the, the lattice. So. A phonon is a really a quantum mechanical uh, excitation of the, of the vibrations. Uh, we've discussed both the Einstein and the Debye model. The Einstein model just states that all the phonons have the same frequency. It looks like a, like a crude approximation, but it works, it works actually pretty well. Uh, it's actually not so good at low temperature, uh, where the, the heat capacity is predicted to to um, decay exponentially fast in the Einstein model, even though the experiment shows that it decays as a as t to the power three. And uh, this mo the model from Debye uh, solved that issue by uh, imagining that the frequency of of the mode changes linearly with uh, the wave vector. And of course, the, the relation of proportionality between the two is the is the the, the velocity, the, the velocity of sound. So we've seen all this, and we see that uh, in both cases, uh, the saturation at high temperature is correct, which is which is simply co simply comes from the fact that we have the right counting of the mode. And uh, we've seen that uh, even though the band structure, so basically the dispersion relation between omega and k and, and q, ready for phonons, uh, can be more complicated than what the Debye or the Einstein model. Uh, represent the, the limiting case are actually pretty well uh, described in, in 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 the in uh, in the case of the Dubai and uh, uh, and the Dubai model for low for low temperature. Thank you, and see you at the next lecture.